get to work. Uh, last week, I, last, we're, I'm in the book of John, so if you're a guest here today, first of all, welcome. It's always our desire. My goal is always that you never leave here on Sunday without something that's going to help you live your life better. So no matter what I'm teaching, whether I'm teaching a topical study on certain things or, or teaching straight through the Bible, and there's always just, I, I want to tell you, I, I told you all when we started John, read it, read it, read it, read it, just keep reading John, because I sit here and work, I've got Got 10 verses here, 10, 11 verses here, and, uh, and there's way more stuff in these 10 or 11 verses than what I can deal with today. We will be out of here by about three, but there's more. There's more than that. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But today I want to talk, well, last week we were in John chapter 4. Today we're in 16 through 26, and Jesus has just met the lady at the well, the Samaritan lady, and she's talking to her. He's talking to her about living water, and she's not understanding spiritually what he's talking about. And, and what I'm calling today's message, and you'll see why here in just a minute, is God wants you to know yourself. God wants you to know him, and he wants you to know yourself. Now, it's important. If you've, if you've been around anybody in your life that has problems, but they're in denial, you know what I'm talking about. A denial person is someone who claims to not know themselves, right? This problem that they're dealing with that they say is, is not a problem. And I just wrote down a definition for denial, just so you can kind of apply it to this conversation that's going to be going on with Jesus and this lady at the well. Denial means trying to hold on to your perceptions of reality when in fact you are avoiding truth. You say that again. Denial means trying to hold on to your own perceptions of reality when in fact you are avoiding the truth. Now we take denial and there's a lot of places we're most familiar with the term denial in the, uh, in the addiction category. But there's a lot of things that we do in our lives. And you know I've had, I've had a couple in my office before counseling and, or many in this same situation where the girl's saying, man he's just angry. And he's sitting there, and because he doesn't yell and throw and knock walls down, he says, I'm not angry. I'm not angry. I'm, and I'm going, dude, you need to look at your face because you're in denial, you know? <laughs> we have this denial, and we have this denial in our relationship with God. We have this denial in our, in our spiritual life. It's, it's easy to be in denial when we're just looking at ourselves and we don't have anything to gauge it by, Right? I've told this story before, but the first time I started playing racquetball, I was in my mid-20s, and, and I was playing one guy who I found out wasn't very good. I thought he had to be good because he'd been playing for years, and I was waxing this guy. I mean, just killing him, and I'm thinking, dude, this might be my gift. I can play racquetball. And, and so, so I went up there one night on challenge night, and I wrote my name on the list, and two different guys only let me score one point. You know, my perception was I must be pretty good, but I was obviously not looking at the things that I need to be looking at. Through God's Word, God's Spirit, and obedience, He wants us to get to know Him and to know us. He wants us to get to know Him and how we interact with Him and how we feel about ourselves because of our relationship with Him. He wants us, God's goal, God's pure goal for you and me is for us to be like Jesus. If someone was to ask you, what's the goal of a Christian? you answer would be, to be like Jesus. So we already know we have something to look at and, and see if that's happening or not. And in Romans 8, 29, God says, I want us, you guys, to be like Jesus. That's what the goal is all is about. And as we continue to look at meeting with Jesus and, and as we look at the way this Samaritan lady interacts with Jesus, Jesus meets with this lady and he shows her his awesomeness, his godness, but he also shows her herself. Now we saw last week, and go back and look, go back and look, it's important stuff. Last week, Jesus gave a presentation of the gospel to someone who didn't have a clue. The Samaritan lady who, the Samaritans are a, are a, a 
a spinoff of the, the Jewish people who intermarried and, and the Jewish people don't like them at all and the Samaritan people don't like the Jewish people at all. But as Jesus sat and talked to this lady at the well, he says, look, if you would take what I have to give you, you would never be thirsty again. And he's talking about meeting those needs that we have in us humanly. And, and all she saw was, what, you mean I'm never going to have to come here to this well again? I'm never going to have to deal with this again? That's why we're here today. We're going to see a case of denial in this Samaritan lady that Jesus meets at the well. Do you ever feel like you're in denial with God? Because God shows us what we need to change. You know, if, if, if we're praying where Jesus is God and Lord of our life, somewhere in our prayer, we should be saying, Lord, I'm sorry for screwing up. And I want you to show me what I need to change. Now again, this is another reason why we need the church. This is another reason why we need our life groups. This is another reason why we need our friends who are Christians who are willing to step up and say, you know, I, I think what you're doing here is not really right. John 3.20, we looked at a few weeks ago, says, all who do evil, now when the Bible here talks about evil, it's not talking about um, all of you who are serial killers. It's saying all of us who do things that are different than what God would want, that would make us evil as we go away from. So all who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. One of the questions on your group discussions for this week is, do you have any people that you've been around and they know you're a Christian that act weird around you because you're a Christian? I don't tell people out in public that I'm a pastor until I feel like it's an okay kind of time to do that because people just change all of a sudden. They just act weird and back off a little bit and, and, you know, and maybe even apologize for something that they said or, or something like that. But, but uh, uh, people avoid that light. And, and what I see is when people are struggling a lot of time, and I see it in a church, that's when they start pulling away because when they're, they're struggling and they're feeling like they're in the dark, they kind of start pulling away from God. And, and then other people even that are very religious and hang out in church all the time, and every time the, jo the doors are open, they avoid a relationship with God, but they try to fill it with the religion part. I can feel good about this because I'm serving, or I can feel good about this because I, I go to church every time the doors are open. Relationships make us uncomfortable when they feel off, right? When, when all of a sudden there, you feel like there's something weird going on between you and this person, or this person is not honest, or you're not honest with this person, it makes the relationship with weird. It's the same way in our relationship with God. So since we can't run from God, we, we try to block God out. Just like Adam and Eve. Isn't it the silliest story you ever saw that Adam hid after he sinned? Adam hid from God. You know, because that's what we do. That's what we do. God shows us, first thing on your blanks, God shows us who we are so that we know that we need Him. God wants us to know that we are just screwed up. I'm saying that in a very nice, politically correct way. We're screwed up. We just, we just, don't, we just don't know because the only thing, if, if, we're, if, we're, if our goal is to be what God wants us to be, to walk the talk, talk the talk, and be like Jesus, then we don't really know if we are being like Jesus unless we're studying who? Jesus. I heard a while back, I don't know if it's still true or not because of the way they... I heard a while back that the, the people that decide whether money is counterfeit or not, they don't study counterfeit money. What do they study? Real money. So when they pick up real money, they go, oh, this is counterfeit. They know because they study the real thing all the time. And, and, and again, that's why, that's, that's why... Look, if you're studying Jesus enough and God enough and what God wants for you enough, if I get up here and start doing some false teaching, you ought to pick on up on that right away. But what I'm saying is, from the very beginning, the Apostle Paul and the other apostles remind, re, we, uh, reminded the church that there are false teachers out there. So you've got to study the real thing so that you'll know what the counterfeit is. And that's my goal for you. 
So let's go over, let's start with the book of James. Let's just start with the book of James, all right? I'm going to be in James 1, and again, if you're a guest here today, the, the uh, scriptures are in your notes. I don't think I'm going to use one today that is not in your notes. But James 1.23 says, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourself. See, I, I would say, I would say the Christian that doesn't obey God probably has more anxiety than the non-Christian who doesn't obey God. Because not only do you know what the Word says, you also know what the Spirit is telling you inside. Because once you become a Christian, the Spirit of the Lord inhabits you. He dwells in you. But don't just listen to God's Word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourself. The self-deception that James is talking about here is is this inappropriate response that we have with truth. And, And I know people... I've... I've known lots of people in my life that are nowhere close to even trying to act like Jesus and they read their Bible all the time. Because what they're trying to do is use the the religion of reading their Bible to make up for the lack that they have in the relationship. And it it just screws them up more. It just screws them up more inside as they're, as they're dealing with that. Look at verse 23. This is an uh-oh verse. We have uh-oh verses and amen verses. But this is an uh-oh verse. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it is like glancing at your face in the mirror. You ignore that prompt to change. I don't have to do that right now. That, that would be like, ladies, if, if you sat down and, and did your makeup and this morning and, and, and all of a sudden you, you slipped and went, oh, that's okay. I'll get it later. Nobody's really ever going to. You just go to, you know, when you, you go to work like this and everybody's stopping. And, and here's the sad thing. Even your Christian friends won't go, oh, you're, you've got to. You know, I, I'll just tell you. If you're around me and something looks screwed up on you, I'm going to tell you. Because I don't want you to be embarrassed. You know? And, and if I'm around you and you see something screwed up on me, don't tell Lisa. Come to me about it. <laughs> but you know, I don't, I'm just, I'm going to give you a trick of the trade, all right? When I come up here to preach most Sunday mornings, I stop here just a second before I turned around. You know Why? I'm checking the zipper. Because there's too many times I've figured out in the wrong time. That, and nobody told me. Why didn't you tell me my zipper was down? I thought you knew. Well, then I'm an idiot for not pulling up my zipper. But we need each other for that. He says in verse 24, you see yourself and you walk away and you forget what you look like. You really do. We have these times, I I guarantee I would ask this question, we'd all raise our hands. We have these times where God gives us these nuggets of wisdom that we know would make our life better and we go, I'm going to try that. And then a week later, we're going, oh, what was that thing I was going to try? Oh, I wish I'd marked that in my Bible. You know, whatever. And, and, and that's, why we, that's why when we have our life group discretions, look, when you guys are, when you guys are listening to the sermon on Sunday morning, it, mark, make some marks. Don't just fill in your blanks. Go, ooh, I want to talk about, put a star. I want to talk about this one at life group. I want to talk about this in a life group. You know, what does this mean? See how other people feel about it or whatever. That's that spiritual conversation that we need. We need to have that spiritual conversation with each other so that when we get an opportunity to have a spiritual conversation with someone who doesn't believe, we've been practicing it. We know what we're going to say. We we know why we feel that way. And, And I learned something from her. I learned something from him. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, circle that. It's the law that sets you free. See, the reason a lot of people are kind of nervous about Christianity, they go, you got this law. But this law is written by the one who created us, and he writes it so that we can be the best we can possibly be, so that we can be like who? 
Jesus so that we can be like Jesus. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says, and don't forget what you heard. Now, what's the best way to not forget what you heard? Do it. See, once you, once you apply something, that's why I, I, I believe the best way to study the Bible is to use the LEAP, LEAP acronym. Listen, uh, engage, apply, and produce. And what happens is you listen, you engage with it. What does this all mean to me? How does this affect my life? What's going on right now? And you apply it. That's what you don't forget. And then when you get the reward for it, it's even more cool. And you're going to trust more with God after that. And don't forget what you heard. Then God will what? Say it with me. Bless you for doing it. It feels so good to do something God wants you to do. Oh, this feels so good. I just did something God wanted me to do. I mean, it's just a, it just changes everything. It gives you that, that great attitude. Next thing you notes, God knows what is best for us. He created us. He wants to bless us with being our best. How many of y'all got kids? How many of y'all want your kids to be the best they can possibly be? And you're not even up to God's ankle. You know what I'm saying? I mean, God wants us to be the best that we can possibly be, and he has the power to make us do that. All we got to do is hang on to that and, 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 and hang on. You know, we all, we understand that. So let's get back to the Samaritan woman. Jesus has shared the truth. He's told her the good news and she's kind of clueless. Oh, you mean I can go away and I never have to come back here and drink water again? And she's talking all the physical. But now he changes the topic. Now here's what I want you to realize. God doesn't ever just walk up to somebody, Jesus, and just start hammering them. You know, you should, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. And he doesn't do that. Even with the, y'all remember the lady that was getting the rocks thrown at her, the adulteress? You know, he, he came up and, and said, hey, those guys are just as bad as you are. Now, the people that don't want to hear the second sentence will tell you, well, Jesus loves everybody. You can act any way you want to. And he follows that up with what? Now go and sin no more. If you want to live your best life, don't live that way. Go and sin no more. But, but he doesn't go jump on them. You look at that all the way through. Who are the people he jumps on? The only people Jesus ever jumps on are people that should know better because they're religious people. They're religious people. They're Jewish people. Those are the ones he jumps on. He's not jumping on this lady. You're going to see here as, as we go. He's not jumping on this Samaritan lady, even though she's not, she's, she lives such a bad life morally that even her Samaritan people don't hang out with her because she's immoral. She's, she's gone against what their laws are. I just, I love the spiritual conversations we have in our life group. It's life-changing. Let me tell you something. In the last week, in the last week, not counting my life group, I've had three different people come up and tell me how much their life group has changed them. Why? Because of the spiritual conversations that they're having. Those spiritual conversations are, are so important because you're hearing, you know, when I teach, I'm the paid holy man. You're expecting me to say certain things. But when you get together and, and you talk about that yourself, it, 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 that helps change people. We, we should always be bringing God into, the, into our life and having the spiritual conversation. Now, this lady is spiritually thirsty. She, she doesn't know that she needs God, but, but, but she's, she's hammering away at life and, and trying to do life. And, and then Jesus comes to her, and, and, uh, and he's going to change the topic completely. Now, he's just got through talking about the water and all that. And then here he goes. Go get your husband. <laughs> now, that wouldn't normally be a, a big deal, right? Well, it would be a big deal that he's a, he's a Jew and he's sitting there talking to a Samaritan. He's saying, you know, she'd be thinking, he's wanting me to go get my Samaritan husband that he hates because he's a Jew. He says, he says, go and get your husband. And what Jesus is doing here, and you're going to see here just a minute if you don't know the story. What Jesus does is he points out our weaknesses. He points out the things we're doing wrong. See, Christians should never feel guilty. 
But conviction ought to be a way of life. Because the only time you feel guilty as a Christian is if you get convicted and then you don't do anything about it. That's called repentance. So if you get convicted and you don't repent, that's when you start feeling guilty. And guilt gets heavy. Conviction doesn't get heavy. It just makes you move. And if you move with that conviction, then it's not going to be heavy on you. But if you don't, it's going to turn into guilt. So, so he's going to talk to her about her weakness. Go and get your husband, Jesus says. See, a reminder, next thing on your notes. We try to fill the God-sized void with the things of this world. Just remember that. And also remember, as in we're in denial, that we're not totally honest. We, we will be kind of be honest if it works for us. But her response, I don't have a husband. That's the truth. She just told him the truth. Does it bother you sometimes the way people pull stuff out of context and use the truth and it's not really the truth, really? The woman replied, Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband. Remember, he's not jumping on her yet. He knows exactly what's going on with her. He says, for you have had five husbands and you aren't even married to the one that you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Now, what do you think... Just, what do you think at least one of the things this lady tried to use to fill the void in her life? Men, right? Men. Look, I, you know, I, I talk to women all the time that, that uh, I'm always, I, I'm not afraid to tell somebody, look, you can date this guy if you want to, but I think you need to raise the bar. If he's not who you think he should be right now and you're thinking you're dating him is going to bring him up a level... That ain't going to happen. It's not going to happen. We, we've we've got we've to be willing to raise that bar. And, 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 and we've got to be able to raise that bar in everything else we do. We, we have to look at our life and go, look, if we're continuing to do these things that God doesn't want us to do, then, then what's happening is, first of all, is we're disobeying God. And, and second of all, now we're struggling with, with the guilt feeling of not doing the things that God wants us to do. God wants us to raise the bar in every area of our, li of our lives, our professional lives, our parenting lives, our, our, uh, our, our character lives. Now, this lady, she knows because she is a religious lady. She belongs to a Samaritan community, a religious community, but she knows that her choices are not the right choices. And we all know that everybody knows that because, uh, look, they, they don't go out to the well at noon it's hot. So everybody goes out to the well at night and they talk and they're friends with each other. And this lady has to go out to the well at noon because nobody's going to treat her right if she comes out there when everybody else is. So she's there. She's a religious lady. Sir, the woman says, you must be a prophet. Now when you first see that... Uh, I just think the next thing she says is, is interesting. She says, sir, you must be a prophet. See, it's, it's hard to trace face truth. What's just happened is, is what it says in James. Jesus said, you're right. You're not, and, and you're with another guy that's not your husband, and you're doing, and she's going, oh my gosh, he knows me. He's a prophet. You ever read the Bible and you go, you know how many times people come up to me and say, you were talking to me today. You must have been reading my mail. That's how the Holy Spirit works, you know? So when you read Scripture and you're going, oh, it's, 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 uh, uh, that's me. I read that today. You'll see somebody put on Facebook. I, I look today and, and man, the Bible and God was talking to me. And, and, and that's what happened here. Jesus has just talked to her. And, and, and how does she handle it? She goes, oh, thank you so much. I repent. I'm going to go do it. No. And dude, she's got Jesus sitting in front of her. And she just got through saying, not only is he a holy man, she knows he's a rabbi, but, but, but he's also a, a, a prophet. It's hard to face the truth because we get used to the discomfort. So we stay in this de denial. So, so she deflects this question of Jesus. Jesus says, he, he asks her this question. 
question and now she, he answers and now she goes, so tell me. Why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place to worship while we Samaritans claim it's here in Ma where our ancestors worship? She's going, okay, let's change the subject. Do y'all ever have that happen? Do you ever talking about one of your friends about being a Christian? Your friend will go, well, why does God let this happen to these people? And, and what about the, the people that got killed in the Old Testament? And they're changing the subject. They're feeling convicted and to feel better about the conviction. They, they change the subject. That's what they use to help them deny God. Remember, I don't believe in an atheist. I'm sorry. I, an atheist, I believe, is just somebody, because Scripture tells us there's enough information out there, there's enough of God's presence for everyone to know that there is a God. Golly, everywhere you go, you never run into a, a, a everything from, you never run into any group of people in the world that doesn't believe in some kind of God. Some of them have a hundred gods or 2,000 gods or whatever, but they all believe that there's, there's some kind of God. Jesus convicts us without condemning us. Jesus convicts us without condemning us. Now she's opened up the, up the door for Jesus to give her the answer because he called, she called him a prophet. Jesus replied, dear me, dear, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter where you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. It's not the place where worship happens. Get this, it's the heart. It's the spirit and the heart. That's where worship happens. Now, we need corporate worship. We need each other. But real worship happens with what's going on in the heart. Matter of fact, you can be standing here on a Sunday morning, singing a song, listening to a message, and not actually worshiping God. You're just doing religion when you do that. Jesus speaks the good news of new and eternal life change for this lady. And then look at John, verse, uh, verses 4, 22 through 24. He says, you Samaritans know very little about the one you worship. While we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews, but the time is coming indeed, for it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way, for God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in the spirit and the truth. That's when life change happens. Because... You may come here on Sunday morning and get in the Spirit and worship in the Spirit. And isn't that awesome? I mean, sometimes you'll cry. Sometimes, you ever laugh and it's kind of a cry at the same time? <laughs> you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to confess. Lisa and I were watching Mama Mia the other night and I did one of those laugh cries. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you just, you feel joy and you feel, and you just do that. And, and that happens when we're in worship. That kind of thing happens. We, we worship in spirit. But here's the deal. You're not worshiping in truth if you don't take the spirit out of here and live the truth. Worshiping in truth is going out and doing it. You're not really worshiping God if you're not going out and doing it. If you're, if you're looking in that word and you see yourself in the mirror and you don't fix your eyeliner and you go off, then what you're doing is, is you're, you're worshiping, but then you're not living the truth. Grow the love and change the world. Grow the love and change the world. The woman says, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ, and, when, and then he will explain everything to us. So as far as we can tell, she really hasn't completely gotten this yet. She's still holding back just a little bit. And then Jesus says this, y'all say this with me. Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. How about you? Do you look to God to see where you should be raising your bar 
in all of your lives, your, in your marriage, in your dating, in your job, in anything you do? Are you looking to God to see where you raise your bar? Because I have people tell me this all the time. Roy, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase. Royal, I'm, I am raising my bar, but I'm not really ready yet to raise the bar here yet, so I'm raising the bar here, even though they know the bar should be here. See, if you know this is where the bar should be, and right now, just to make life easier, you're keeping the bar right here, this is going to cause pain in your life. Because when you know and you don't act like, uh, you don't act on what you know, it's very stressful. Some of you guys can look back on your life and went, oh, if I'd only done this. Oh, if I'd only done that. Some of us have a lot of those things we do. And some of us do that every day in our spiritual life. And I can promise you this. I will promise you this. If you prove me out wrong, come talk to me. But I can promise you this. If you decide today that you're going to live your life worshiping God in spirit and living out the truth and you're going to set your bar according to where God says for you to set your bar and you're going to live under God's grace and do the best way that you possibly can and be that person who's representing God here on earth being like Jesus I promise you I can't promise you wealth I can't promise you a new house I can't promise you a new job in Tyler I can't promise you any of those things but I can promise you peace and love and joy, and confidence, and contentment. We want those things. 